The base is dropped on another edition of Soccer Down Here. It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday Thoughts edition of the show. Use the hashtag tweet at us at Soccer Down Here with your thoughts, with your questions, with your comments, whatever's on your mind this morning. You can also email us, Soccer Down Here at Gmail. You can also watch on twitch.tv slash Soccer Down Here. Join the chat room. Uh, sometimes the conversations get going in the chat room before we can even get to them, but that's always fun too. Lots of stuff to get into today. Uh, John, did you make it through the end of LAFC Seattle? Yes, I did. That's why I'm wearing a hat and my jacket this morning for those watching on Twitch. Why are you wearing a jacket this morning? Because of a game last night? Because I'm cold here in Office HD. Some mornings I'm not. This morning I am. (laughs) Why are you cold because of a game last night? I'm confused. Because it was it was late. I didn't have enough chance to stay under the covers for a prerequisite amount of time to be properly warm to come down here into the office this morning. See, I'm the guy <laughs> I'm the guy who likes to have the fan on or, or the, the yeah. just you know, like the fan on when you sleep, but have like ninety eight covers. Okay. And so I didn't have enough time to have the fan on and be warm enough under the covers. So I was still cold when I woke up this morning. And so now I'm like this in a cold office and wearing all this stuff. So it's a holdover from not having enough sleep. That that is some weird, wild stuff. That is funny. I did not know that would be so funny. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, Johnny. Yes. That's accurate. Uh, Seattle was horrible defensively. Oh, my God. Oh. I, I mean, LAFC was good. Um, and LAFC's defense was probably their best performance since game one, where, where they shut out Miami. Um, Seattle was bad defensively. Yes, they were. And, and LAFC is, had problems defensively, but they looked competent. Seattle did not. Um, Look, Seattle, since they got rid of, or since Chad Marshall retired, since they got rid of Kim Kihi, uh Xavier Arriaga is supposed to be the guy, and he's not looking like the guy. Mm-hmm. It's it's a problem. What are they going to do defensively? We'll have to see. Uh, LAFC created a ton of chances. It could have been worse. Um, I'm fascinated by this next round matchup for LAFC, though. I just, you know, I, I looked at, I, I was watching it last night, and I, I just, what was it, the 65th? It, it's, and it's hard for me to formulate how bad Seattle was last night for me, because it was, what, the 65th minute when they got their first shot on net, and it was a really yeah. weak header from the top of the box? Yeah, what what LAFC showed, they're going to be frail defensively until they upgrade. Uh, Dejan Yakovic, Tristan Blackman, mm-hmm. I think are a big step down from where they were. But if you control possession and you play in the other team's half, you can take a lot of pressure off of your defense. And, and they did that for most of the night. That made it a lot easier for them. Um, they were a little wasteful at times, but they, they created so many chances that it really didn't matter. I was equally impressed with LAFC and surprised at how bad Seattle was defensively. Seattle doesn't look like the same team they were last year. They never really got going with the attack either. They never threatened LAFC enough to take advantage of that. So Orlando LAFC, Saturday night. Um, Am I doing my math right? Is it Saturday night or is it Friday night? 31st. Yeah, that doesn't help me. I don't know days anymore, remember? <laughs> so so today's the 28th. That's Friday. So 29, 30, 31. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can count from 28 to 31. It was more about the days. Well, it's... I had to do the whole 30 days, has September, <laughs> April, June, and November. I the rest have 31. And I'm but, trying to do it that way. But he <laughs> said the 31st to begin with, so it didn't matter. Uh, you're really confusing me this morning, John. I didn't get enough sleep last night to deal with this. You and me both. Seriously. Uh, Orlando LAFC in the next round. Orlando has been better defensively, but this is going to be their biggest test. Uh, but they've been pretty good going forward, and that's going to test LAFC. Yeah. I'm, I'm very intrigued. We got a ton of questions on Twitch already, and, and since wow. we're both punchy, we should probably go ahead and <laughs> jump over to that. Um, 
I forgot to press buttons to, to make it not echoey, but yes, I was going for a vibe this morning. So we, we stopped the vibe, though. It was too much. Stop the vibe. Um, Atlanta Phoenix says, uh, morning, could not join you yesterday live and had a question about Stephen Glass. Mm-hmm. How might we expect the team to change under his interim leadership? Uh, it's a good question, and it's really unknown because you're talking about somebody who has not been uh, as a manager in MLS yet. You're talking about somebody who has managed a second team. And, and managing a second team is very different than managing a first team. You know, Steven's job with Atlanta United 2 has been to have players either who are contracted to Atlanta United 2, have players who are coming up from the academy, or to have players coming down from the first team to play. It's all within the prism of what the first team is doing. You know, if you go back and you look at Atlanta United 2 tactics, formations, and you compare that to what the first team was doing at that time, there's a lot of similarity. Uh, it's not, you know, dead on facsimile, but there's a lot of similarity because otherwise you're not doing your job. If you have a if you have a good left back, um, well, let, let's take George Bellow, for example, last year. So George Bellow comes down to play for Atlanta United 2 um, after his surgery, and he's not going to factor into the first team. They've already made that decision, but you know he's going to in the following year. You're not going to play him as a stay-at-home left back very often because that's not how he would have played for the first team under Frank DeBoer. You're going to play him as a wing back, and I think Steven even at times played him as a left winger with a left back behind him to get him in that attacking frame of mind. You're not going to have him sit at home. You're going to play guys in roles that are going to be close to what they do for the first team. So what is he going to do on his own? I don't know. I'm really intrigued to find out, to be honest. Um, I think that side we don't know. What we know from a personality standpoint, he is somebody who is very vocal. Um, It's going to be a little different in that regard because, you know, Tata Martino was somewhat vocal on the touchline, but not dramatically. Uh, Frank DeBoer was probably less so, and Stephen Glass will be very vocal. Um, He will work really hard for the players to understand their roles to where they make those decisions. Something that Frank DeBoer talked about, too, that when things need to change with subtlety in the match because of what the opponent's doing because of the situation. He's going to work really hard on the training pitch in the lead-up to games so the players make those adjustments on the fly. That's something that he has really worked hard with with young players with Atlanta United too because you know it, it's hard to make big tactical changes from the bench during the match. A little bit easier right now when you have hydration breaks. You can do that in the middle of the half, but Steven has, has really worked hard to build that understanding of what the changes are. If you see this, do this, that kind of stuff. Um, formation wise, I don't know. I, I don't know what he's going to do. Um, it's probably going to depend a lot on the players available. I mean, we've seen his teams in all of the different permutations that we've seen Atlanta United, you know, the first team in we've seen him play three, five, two. We've seen him play three, four, three. We've seen them play var- variations of the three, four, three, the three, four, one, two, or the three, four, two, one. We've seen him in a four, three, three, could call it more of a four, two, three, one, if you want. Um, anything the first team's played over the last year and a half, we've seen the second team play in, which is what you would expect. I think one difference, and some of it is down to the differences in the roster. He has had his Atlanta United 2 squad press a little bit higher, and I think some of that's down to the youth of that squad. He's really wanted to make it difficult for opponents to play out. So that line of confrontation has been very, very high. That's something we've seen at times, but not consistently with the first team, especially this year. It's been less consistent this year than it was towards the end of last year. I'll be curious to see if we see that. If he's going to be asking Pitti Martinez, Ezekiel Barco, if it's Adam John, if it's Manuel Castro, whatever the option is up top that, that Steven decides on. I'll be curious to see if he can do that with that group of players or if he has to find a way to create a way to do that. If it means Pitti drops off and, and Barco steps up and maybe one of the, the central midfielders steps up or one of the wingbacks steps up. There's lots of different ways you can do it. And he's going to have a little bit of time here to do it. And he's also had a lot of experience watching the first team and probably taking notes on things that 
you know, he sees in the first team he would want to make those changes with the second team, work on it there so they don't have those issues as they go to the first team. Now he's going to get to go to the first team and work on it. So it's going to be really interesting. I don't think you can take it just from looking at Atlanta United 2 and saying, oh, he played like this, so he's going to play like that for the first team. I, I don't think that's the, the job he had it with the twos. Yeah, no, I think that it is, while you may see some similarities, it's going to be, I think it's going to be a case-by-case, match-by-match basis. Well, you're gonna hold see. on. You're going to see some similarities. Yeah. There's no way around it's that. Not, it's not going to be the carbon copy, yeah, we're going to do this every single time out. This is how it's going to be. No, well, no that, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I want to make sure you're going where, I, I'm not sure where you're going. Um, he might settle on playing a four-three-three and play it every day. There's nothing wrong with that. No. What I'm saying is you can't look at what he did with Atlanta United 2 and say, oh, he's a 3-4-3 guy. No, he was playing that because that's what the the first team was playing. It wouldn't have made sense for him to play a 4-4-2 diamond. Right. We don't know what he's going to do on his own as he assesses this roster and as he assesses the best way to win. There's no way to know. And he could change it every game. He might not. That The, the thing is we don't know what his base is going to be. That's that's what I'm getting to. I think we understood that Frank's base was a three four three. It's what he played a good bit. What's what he, well, that was his base this year anyway. Last year it did have to change a little bit due to injuries, and he had to mix it around. This year three four three has been the base. I don't think that means that Stephen Glass comes in and plays a three four three. Right. Yeah. That's that's what I was getting at. It's like we have that we have this base of knowledge from what we saw with Glassy. With Atlanta United too, knowing how things are going to be with the first team and what you're going to see and how things have to kind of be similar, but we don't know how as him being the boss now with Atlanta United, how things are going to change. And especially, yeah, you'll have this base idea, but then against your opposition, will your ideas change when you see who the We don't even know what the base idea is. So, I mean, figuring out what changes you're going to get – you need to get your base first. Right. Like you're not you're not worrying as much right now about okay, Philadelphia would do this, so I gotta change for this when I play Philadelphia. No. You gotta figure out what you're gonna do. Right. That's the number one thing. And that might take a time. So let's not get it twisted. Steven Glass is not coming in here to run like Pep Guardiola. Steven Glass is coming in here to fix a broken team at the moment. And he's gotta focus on that. Does that mean at times he's not going to be able to match up to the opposition? Yeah, he's not going to be able to because he's worked with these guys one time right now. He's got to figure out what works best for this team. Now, over time, depending on how long he has, he can add in things as he goes. But he's got to focus on this team first. That's the number one thing. This is not a – this is the hard part about it because I've seen the questions about it. This is not an audition. This is an interim basis. This is to right the ship. And if he does well, it's going to benefit Stephen Glass's long-term career here or elsewhere. But his job is to right the ship. And that's his focus. It's not about being a tactical wizard when you play this other team. It's about fixing what's wrong here. And he's going to have an opportunity to do that and come in and say, I think this team is best with Adam John up top. I think this team is best with J.J. Williams up top. I think this team is best with two up top. He's going to be able to figure that out. Four in the back, three in the back. He's going to have that say right now, and he's going to get to put that stamp down. So that's number one and two and three and four and five until you get that sorted. Then you can start to add layers. You can't complicate it. And this is what happens so often with a young manager who comes in and says, all right, I want to play like this, and we're going to take a session here and do this, and, and now we know how to play, and, and now we're going to work on what this other team does, and now we're going to do this, and you're confusing people. Yeah. And Steven's been there and done that. He's not going to do that. He's going to keep it simple. That's coming from an academy standpoint, coming to a second team standpoint. He's not going to overly complicate it because he's used to not having a ton of time with the team that's going to play that weekend or that next match. He is going to figure out what he thinks is the right way forward, He's going to do that as quickly as possible, and then he is going to work on that till it's good. That's where you're at with, with Glassy coming into this group. I think he's going to do well. I think he's going to do well, but you know he's he ha- doesn't have experience at the first team level as a manager. This is an eye-opening thing for him as well. He's there 
to get this sorted out. And he is a fresh voice. He's a very different kind of voice. I think that will help a lot as much as anything tactically. I think his personality will help this group a lot. And we, we see what happens when games are scheduled. But it, it's not his tactics. I mean, he's going to figure out the way to play. But his tactics are, are not even the biggest issue with this group right now. When you go back and look at what he said in, in the press release, what Darren Neal said to Doug Robertson, all the stuff from The Athletic, and you start to piece it all together, there were personality problems with this group. Yeah. Yeah. And Glassy's personality is going to be a big help to be the leading voice in it because it's a different kind of voice. Just having a different voice, I think, is going to help, period. But having his voice is going to help in a big way. So that's number one. And that's just getting this group functioning again. And then you go step by step. But don't put a whole bunch of other stuff out there in front. You know, it, Yes, if he does really, really well, he's going to have opportunities here or elsewhere. Um, if he takes his team to MLS Cup and wins it, yeah, it's going to be hard to, to go in a different direction. But Atlanta United's looking to go with a, a worldwide search right now. That's not going to stop based off a couple wins. So that's the job you're in. That's when you take over a second team. You understand that. If things happen, you're going to bump up. You're going to be in charge for a while. But yeah, the first team's looking for, for somebody, maybe a big name, maybe not. Maybe somebody with a ton of experience. Who knows? But they're going to be looking. You've got the reins for a while. You drive things pretty well, you're going to change your standing in the long term. And that's the opportunity at hand for everybody involved. Yeah, that was because what you were just discussing is what Jason Hindley was asking. Yeah, and that's why I got there. So, Jason, thank you for the question. And it's just going to be down to timing and how things go. But that's not the plan it is for you know Stephen to, to be the manager full time. That, that's not his role right now. He is needed with Atlanta United, too. He's done a very good job preparing players for the first team. That's his role. And don't get hung up on results with Atlanta United, too. You know, you're talking about a team that's going into games generally given, on average, seven, eight years per player. Uh, you're going into some of these games that are very difficult situations for teenagers. And it's younger right now than maybe it would have been because everybody was in Orlando with the first team, and, and that's okay, but... You're also seeing some of these young players emerge to where it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's something there. Cole McGannon, there's something there. Jackson Conway on a second team contract, there's something there. He's really progressing this year. Uh, you're seeing guys start to say, hey, I can be a professional. That's a vital part of Steven's role in the club. If it goes well, maybe that role changes. But that's his role, and you're not looking for that to change at the moment. Opportunities? You never know where they can lead you. And this is an opportunity, and we will see where it leads. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow night, by the way, subtle plug, Atlanta United 2 against the Miami FC. Not a Miami FC, the Miami FC. And that is at a little after 7.30, but 7.30 on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, Jason and I will have the call from Fifth Third. Once again, this is the second home match of the season there will be no fans allowed at fifth third bank stadium so uh be a, an interesting environment for us and uh, tony annan on, in charge on the touchline so that'll be that'll be us on the plus uh, tomorrow night at 7 30 okay real madrid striker mariano diaz tests positive for coronavirus um 10 days ahead of their champions league match with manchester city 26 year old Perfect health, self-isolating at home after being tested on Monday. So they got those results back quickly. Um, senior squad only resumed team training on Tuesday uh, following a short holiday after the, the league season ended. So, okay, so time-wise, and this is what I, where I wanted to see this. So they returned to training today. He was tested yesterday, test positive. They had not been training. So the chances of transmission through the team is minimal, depending on who he was hanging out with while they were on their holiday. So something to keep an eye on. Um, definitely something to keep an eye on. But that's not a that's if you just hear that you're like, oh, it's going to go through the team because he tested positive. 
It's not a Marlin situation. They weren't training, but we'll have to see where this goes. Um, they are they are going to Manchester on August seventh for the second leg of the last sixteen tie. Um, he probably wouldn't have played anyway. He only made seven appearances for the first team this season. I, I saw the the scroll come through on ESPN, and I'm like, wait a minute, he's not one of the regulars, but how regular is he? Right. That's If you hear that, it's like, oh no, but then you start to get into it, and wait a minute, he, they weren't training, so it's not spreading. It's, it's not that he's not an important player, it's just that he wasn't training with the first team, and he wasn't likely to feature in this game anyway. Now, Hugh Elliott, the UK ambassador to Spain, told Spanish media that the Real Madrid players and staff are exempt from the quarantine measures, a 14-day quarantine. Uh, they'd be inside a bubble in order to reduce the risk of transmission while they're in Manchester. So you've got those games, four games that are going to be played, second leg of the round of 16, um, not this weekend, but next weekend. And they're going to be played in venues, in home venues. And then everything beyond that is going to be in Lisbon in Portugal for the one-off quarterfinal, semifinal, final. That's all going to get really weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you could have some interesting matchups. There was the uh, coming through on the other side of this. There was the news yesterday about uh, Mbappe and the severity of his ankle injury. Which I mean, did right you see now the has, thing? Good grief! Yeah. Oh my god. Uh, so he is listed. He is listed as questionable heading into that uh, <laughs> heading into that next matchup, but. Uh, that was not that was not pretty by any stretch of the imagination. No, there, there's very little expectation of him playing in that game. I think that was a nasty tackle, nasty injury. <laughs> um, Mr. Fantastic and Shiva both very impressed with LAFC and what they're doing without their top guy. We, we've talked about it. I think there are differences. It's easy to say, well, they don't have Vale. Atlanta doesn't have Joseph, so Atlanta's stupid. LAFC's great. They play differently, and they're also playing different teams. Um, it is something to, to look at, though. I, I think the thing about LAFC without Vela, they thought, I, I believe anyway, uh, when they went and got Brian Rodriguez last season, last summer, he was supposed to replace Diego Rossi, who they yeah. thought would be sold at this point. Uh, he's not. I think he will be. I think he very well could be at the end of this tournament. But he's still there. So you had Rossi, Rodriguez, and Vela, who could all play out wide. So Rodriguez is a Uruguayan international. I mean, you're not talking about just a, a backup here. You're talking about a, a replacement for a top player who is still there, and you were able to make the money work. That's the impressive part for me, is that LAFC has been able to manage the cap and get some of these guys in and be able to have them sit, and wait just a little bit to get their play in time, and then come in. That's what's helped them not lose a beat here. Also, you go get Bradley Wright Phillips, and you upgrade from Adama Diamande, who's been very good at times, but inconsistent. And BWP is is feeling it right now. So all that, playing poor defenses, it all helps. But LAFC has been very impressive. Let's see how they do in the quarterfinals now. They're going to play Orlando, Oscar Pereja, I think is a very good manager who will come up with a game plan here to make it difficult. Does he have the talent to play with LAFC? Can he do what Seattle didn't do last night? What they did in the playoffs last year, disrupt LAFC. It's going to be down to you know players like Junior Urso. It's going to be down to players like Uri Rossell. It's going to be down to a player like Juan getting forward, making life difficult. They're going to have to disrupt because if LAFC can get possession – play in your half, they wear you down over time. They want to have the ball, they want to have the ball at their feet, and they want to play in your half because they're trying to take pressure off of their poor defense. They don't want to give up those breaks. We'll see if Orlando can exploit some of that. But yeah, LAFC's been great. And Alex Pacine with a good point here. You had the four conference finalists last year. Three of them are out. Mm -hmm. The only one that's left is LAFC. The one thing that I didn't see out of Seattle last night defensively was any kind of physicality to kind of disrupt LAFC when they were on offense, to, 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 to have them stop and start, to have that offense stutter in possession. You didn't see any of that from Seattle last night. And when you don't knock them off their pegs a little bit, tell them that you're going to be physical off, the, off of the beginning, 
you allow them to get into that flow and they can see what they're able to do offensively and they can take the liberties and have that freedom that we saw last night. It just I think that the key off the off the beginning, I think, is just to be physical with them to, to let them know that you're going to be there all night long. They couldn't catch them. I mean, they, they just couldn't catch them. And uh, it was poor from Seattle. I mean, as good as LAFC was, I was as shocked at how poor Seattle was. And they didn't have a good tournament in this event either. Um, I mean, out of those four final, out of the three finalists who were gone, three conference finalists from last year, man, I mean, Atlanta was the worst because they didn't get out of the group. But Toronto and Seattle wasn't that far ahead of them. It was not good. Toronto's had some injury issues. They're still reincorporating Josie Altador into the group. Io Akinola was really good. He was out for the last game. Seattle just, they they have to solve their defensive issues. Um, They were able to do it enough last year to get through. I still think it's a problem. Um, I think it could be a problem for LAFC as well. We'll see if they get tested. Because I think the teams that have tested that defense have found success. But you got to put a stop to LAFC just wearing you down. And teams haven't done that well enough in this tournament. Portland is one who did. They got the 2-2 with them. We'll see what Pereja and Orlando does. Uh, Ricky Ricardo with a question. Yeah. What are y'all's thoughts on the MLB news and how it applies to sports resuming in the fall in non-bubble situations, MLS, NFL, college football? What are you looking to see or looking to avoid? Like, What are you looking for when you hear this news? Well, out of Major League Baseball, so specifically with the Marlins, I yeah. want to know what their protocols were or if they existed. I, I want to know, were they exhibiting responsibility, staying isolated? How, what were their interactions in the community? What was the testing going on with the Marlins before the season actually started? Was there any testing before the season started with the Marlins? You know, for me, that I'm looking at... Well, there had to be. I, I mean, that was... They had to be. That that's not in, that's not right. The Marlins but had just, to test before the season. But okay, then let's let's get into personal responsibility, and then the notion that you have a player text vote with all of the positives going that's... around, which apparently uh, last time I, I've seen everything that I've read when it comes to the protocols and how Major League Baseball had their you know marching orders heading into the season. Player text chain was not one of the ways to figure out whether or not you were actually going to play if you had team positive. Let's get the the details here because the way this went down, um, Sunday morning, starting pitcher, two other players tested positive. That's what they learned on Sunday morning. Now, their testing results are coming a little delayed, um, and that's a huge problem for Major League Mm -hmm. Baseball. Yeah. So... uh, your your scheduled pitcher, two other players test positive. Uh, Marlins players decided to continue. Um, Miguel Rojas, their shortstop, told the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, we made the decision that we're going to continue to do this and we're going to continue to be responsible and just play the game as hard as we can. Uh, not playing was never the mentality. We knew that this would happen at some point. We came to the ballpark and we were ready to play. That was never our thought that we weren't going to play. And this is about the game on Sunday. Right. Um, he's Don Mattingly, the manager said he's like the unofficial team captain texting the group, getting the feelings of the group. Yeah. Uh, he's the one that everybody turns to in these situations. So the MLB manual for all of this is that after a player tests positive, and in this case you had three, mm-hmm. the club must conduct contact tracing to identify the individuals who had close contact with the player who tested positive. The Marlins flew from Atlanta to Philadelphia before traveling by bus to the hotel. Um, they also dressed near each other in the clubhouse and sat together in the dugout. Now, the, the question that I have about that, where you get into the protocols, when you hear the other side of things and you hear teams talking about, we're splitting the group into different locker rooms, we're, we're spreading them out. Um, Manchester City put a video up on how they were returning to training when they did and they had you know chairs set across a gym so everybody could be distanced as they were getting ready to go train. You're doing all that to limit the interaction and limit prolonged interaction, and that's part of this. It's all of this is really hard because 
there's not one voice that is explaining all of this to us. And that's a massive issue with everything from you and I to teams trying to play. It is one voice over here yelling something, one voice over here yelling something. Okay, we get this document. Okay, we get this study. Okay, we get this over here. They don't always mesh, and everybody is confused. There's a couple things that I'm finding consistently in them in that if you want to get sports back, if you want to have MLS, NFL, college football, Major League Baseball finish their season, if you want to do this and do it safely, there's some things that are just non-negotiables. Um the bubble is going to be hard to do for everybody. It is. It's the best way. I, I think there's there's no way around that now. For all the questions about the bubble and how it could actually make things worse, that hasn't happened. The bubble's been the best way to do this. Okay? It's not feasible. All right, now what? You've got to limit interaction, even once within your group. So if this happens, if a player is not personally responsible, if a player... Um, look, I don't know if Lou Williams hung out at Magic City or not. Uh, he, he said he picked up the wings. Uh, he at least went in and did something he shouldn't have been doing, and some pictures were taken. If you have a player who does that, now he's going to be quarantined for 10 days away from his group. But if you have a player who breaks the protocols and goes rogue and goes to do whatever, if you are doing within your group, if you're not having all the guys changing in the clubhouse, if you're not having everybody sit next to each other in the dugout, if you're not doing those things, one player is not going to wreck a whole team. Right. That's part of this, and that's something that needs to be understood. That's why you had, in, in Germany, players sitting in the stands you know, rows apart. That's why you've had some of these situations. Now, you have to understand the, the risks here, because that's why high-fiving... And, and zeroing in on high-fiving is a waste of time. It's so stupid. You're the, a high-five, the risk from high-fiving somebody after they hit a home run or after they score a goal, is minimal. The risk of sitting in the clubhouse for an hour, getting dressed, talking, hanging out, that's the problem. The high-five isn't the problem. A hug after a home run is not the problem. It's hanging out for an extended period of time. That's the problem. And if you're not handling that correctly, that's on Don Mattingly. Yeah. That's on the leadership of that team because what is – why is it only happening to one team? So it does scare everybody in MLS. It does scare everybody in NFL and college football that, that you have this happen. Now, a couple things I'm looking for right now. Are you going to have any issues with the Philadelphia Phillies? Um, they postponed their game yesterday, but they are scheduled to play today. Which doesn't really make a lot of sense in the grand scheme of things, but this is the reaction to what happened. If the Phillies test negative and you get through everything and you're good, that can tell you that in baseball at least, and I would assume in soccer because of what we've seen from our history in this so far through all the different leagues, the risk of transmission from playing the game is low. That's a huge issue with this because a lot of people think that, okay, the Marlins had it, so now all the Phillies are infected. Again, you get back to how often were they around one another. Not very. So if that doesn't happen, that's going to be a good thing for bouncing back from this. Football's a little different because of the line of scrimmage and the way things go down in football that I have some concerns about the way the game is played affecting it. We'll have to see about that because I don't know. Nobody studied it. It hasn't happened yet. Nobody, it hasn't, they haven't played. I'd love to see somebody do a study, which you could do. You're just going to have to get the manpower to do it. Take a, a game, college game, pro game, whatever you want, and study how long people are within six feet of other people for more than depends on who you talk to. Some people say five minutes is the, the number that is the magic number. Some say 10, some say 15, whatever you want, do all of them. How often is number 75 within five feet or within six feet of somebody for five minutes, for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, for extended periods of time. 
does the line of scrimmage since they're like coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. Is that okay? Give us those numbers. Instead of all the conjecture, instead of all the, well, this, well, that, well, this, we're, we're guessing here, we're going to do it this way, we're, we're going to have everybody work out together, well, we're not going to have them work out together, we're not going to test, we're going to test. Instead of all that, can, can we get some people who can actually tell us you know, what the risk would be from football? Soccer, that part's been shown. You're not around a player from the opposing team for extended periods of time in the game. The times you are are when everybody confronts a referee or on a set piece, and you're not there for five minutes. You're not waiting to take a corner for five minutes standing there marking somebody. So, soccer's low risk. And this is where I get frustrated because you see you know, people talking here, experts talking here, and it's, well, baseball's low risk because of this. Football's high risk, and there's nothing to cite. And soccer is in the middle. But you have studies in soccer showing that you're not being around you're not around players for extended periods of time. That risk is low. Where the risk kicks in is within your team when you are not responsible for how your team conducts its business. When your team is having a meal, socially distance. There's no reason not to, other than just we don't want to. But if you want to stay safe, distance. Sit further apart from one another. You know, you want to do something as a group in the evening, make sure everybody's wearing a mask. Like no non-negotiable stuff here. You want to keep the team safe? That's how you do it. The game is not as big of a deal. The travel, you got to be careful, but you can do it. Those are the things that I'm worried about. And I'm I'm worried in this country that you don't have the people who did what they did in Germany when the rules were coming up for the Bundesliga and cross-checking every single possible thing in every single possible protocol that was there. And it was cross-checked and cross-referenced, and they looked over here, and they talked to this person, and they talked to this professor, and they studied this. It's based in fact. And that plan was by far the best one because it was the first one and the hardest one to do, and they nailed it. Why are you not doing that here if you want to play football? Why is baseball not being smarter about the way they're handling things? There's no reason to be that right now. It is just either you're confused because in this country, the conversation around all of this is very confusing and people are seemingly intentionally trying to mislead people about this. Or you just don't care. And that doesn't make any sense when you are paying this much money to these athletes to play for your business and you're not going to handle it correctly. You're not going to take things responsibly. It's, it's really frustrating at this point because I don't think anybody's doing this properly. I mean, you're seeing now on, on Get Up, for example, on ESPN, uh, the Detroit Lions showing up for their, I guess, first round of testing. Um, you got the Tier 1, Tier 2 access, all that kind of stuff. We'll see how they do it because football, and John, you can speak to this. I mean, with high school football, you know it inside and out. You're not thinking about social distancing in the way you prepare for a training session, for a game, just to be as a team. Social distancing is not in mind, and now it has to be to limit risk. When you're looking at, when you're looking at football, I mean, just from what – I've seen, and, and the NFL has, in, in the NFLPA, they have things that they have laid out for uh, protocols and fines and such, but just taking it from the high school perspective, because they don't have universal testing across the board, because they don't have the resources for it, they've consulted colleges and a lot of uh health individuals associated with collegiate athletics. It's like, okay, so what if we do this, 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 and this? And here in our footprint yesterday, there were two counties that had their football programs test multiple positive. And they have suspended everything. One of those two counties had uh, interaction with other individuals with those positives. So there was, there was closed quarters there and they're having to go back and retrace and see who might else have been infected. 
uh, hopefully no one else has. But in the other case, once again, it's just a limited number of individuals, and they're trying to figure out the, the genesis of that as well. It is consultation, it is checking temperatures, and it's it, this, and this should be a, a universal thing. It is student athletes being honest with their coaches and their elders. If you're not feeling well, tell them. Hold on one second, too. Sure. That part? Mm-hmm. Has that ever been part of a high school football program? No. That's that's a huge issue because what's the mentality? Rub some dirt on it and you know dust yourself off, and then the peer pressure that's associated with it of, well, if I'm not playing, I'm perceived as weaker than my teammates, I'm not part of the collective, all of that stuff. And it is a learned thing yeah. that high school coaches are now honest about. And, and I've talked to multiple coaches who are learning this kind of stuff as this is, these are teachable moments yep. that we're seeing on the high school level with adults who've been coaches for 25 years. And the first thing that they tell their kids is they're heading into practices because right now there are a lot of states that have either pushed schedules back or they've completely flipped them. Here in our footprint, the state of Georgia has just pushed them back two weeks and that's it. But the biggest thing that the, that the coaches have told, have told their students and their student athletes if you're not feeling well, call me and tell me. Don't come here yeah. because one coach, and I'll, and I'll give you an instance real quick. One instance where during dead week, and this is the week where everybody stays away, you get in your last vacations and all that kind of stuff right. at the end of last month. Kid doesn't feel well, gets tested, tests positive, then goes to the first practice after dead week. <sighs> Does it tell his coaches that he tested, wasn't feeling well, he fibbed to his coaches, says, yeah, I'm fine, no, I'm, I, did, I didn't run a temperature the last couple of days, all that kind of stuff. The first workout, the first day after dead week, it is kicking his ass. Mm-hmm. And he finally owns up. He's like, man, you know, it's just... I, I thought I was tired and everything. He owns up to his position coach, not to his head coach. He owns up to his position coach. Yeah, I was running a temperature. Yeah, I got tested. They had to shut practice down for the remainder yeah. of the week at that moment. You have to. You have to get everybody away from him. I mean, that's just – when, and that's the thing. When it's kids, it's, uh, it's you want to give them some benefit of the doubt here as they, they make mistakes. That's – unacceptable and you have to create a culture where that's unacceptable yeah i'll give the atlanta braves a ton of credit you know their two catchers on the roster didn't test positive have tested negative the whole time uh showed symptoms didn't feel well they left them at home for the first mm-hmm. series uh yeah. <laughs> called up two catchers who i think one had played in four games i don't know if Contreras had, had even played in major league baseball at that point because that's what you had to do. You it, you couldn't risk it. And, and you could have taken them. You could have played them. Because they didn't test positive. They still haven't, as far as I know. They've tested negative the whole way. But they didn't feel well. They showed some symptoms. Don't take them. It, it's going to have to be that way. This thing with, the, with the, the Marlins. The Marlins have had a breakdown for sure. Yeah. And you have to find out what caused the breakdown. Does that mean that you can't play the rest of the season? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. But you have to identify what happened here so it doesn't happen again with another team. Are you going to have, in non-bubble scenarios, are you going to have positives happen because people are at home, because people do things that they shouldn't do, and also because people... It's bad luck in some ways, I guess, if you you know are doing everything right and you still come into contact with somebody and you still contract the, the, the virus. Yeah, it can happen too. But if you're not in a bubble, it's going to happen. There, there's just no way around it. It happens to every job, every business, everybody right now. That's the risk you're running. That's real. So it's going to happen for sports. Um, if you are doing everything correctly, you can handle it and you cannot have it spread. It sounds like the Marlins had that problem. Now, 
where it gets tricky is if numbers keep going up across the country and that risk for everybody, including athletes, continues to go up, then you start to get to a point as, well, can you can you do anything? And sports would be included in that conversation. It's hard. There's not an easy answer here. We've talked about it all summer. Um, even your Major League Baseball, even your NFL teams that are, make tons of money and have owners who have lots of money, even those teams are going to have massive hits if they don't play this season. Yep. There, there's just no way around it. It's a different scale, but it is the same reason why restaurants are trying to find ways to be open and deliver safely in what they do, whether that is curbside, whether that is takeout, whether that is dine-in service. They are trying to find ways to do it safely. Why? Because they want to stay in business. That is going to be part of this equation, and it is not greed. It is not this horrible thing. It is literally... You're a business, and you're trying to find a way to still be a business, Mm -hmm. and it's hard. And, you know, we talked about it with the NFL. When you start talking about the NFL and say, oh, just shut it down. They're all rich. It's no problem. What's that going to do for CBS? What's that going to do for ESPN? What's that going to do for NFL Network? Well, yeah, I mean, NFL Network, duh. I mean, for all of the different people who work in the industry – I mean, jobs are going to get wiped out. So this is why it's complicated. And and this is why you are not just, okay, this is going to be hard. Don't do it. You're trying to find a way because it's real. You know, there are jobs on the line. There are people's livelihoods on the line. But it's got to be safe. And you can't have these slip-ups like the Marlins. So... Major League Baseball, look, the NFL, I'm sure they're watching very, very closely. I'm sure the the major conferences in college football are looking very, very closely at what happened and why. MLS has to be because MLS is the one who probably needs it more than anybody to get back on the field and get these games played and bring in whatever you can bring in this season. And you see something like this and you're like, well, how can we avoid that? What can we do to avoid it? And you have to find out if you can. And... My assumption at this point, and it is an assumption, because I'm not in the Marlins group text. I'm not in their clubhouse. The Marlins did something differently than every other team in Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. And you have to find out what they did differently. If it was just they were very slack on people not wearing masks, if they were very slack on team gatherings, if they were just very slack on anything, have to find out what it was. Because it can't happen to anybody else. You can't have this continuing if you want to have a Major League Baseball season. And they need to have a Major League Baseball season. These networks that are broadcasting it, they need Major League Baseball. It's tricky. It's tough. It's difficult. It's where we're at right now in the world. And there's no easy answers. NFL, just uh, to update everybody, NFL and the PA agreed to daily testing for the first two weeks of camp. After that, they'll look at positivity rates. If the rate drops below 5% for players and individuals, and they have uh, separate tiers, they'll move to every other day. Players will need multiple tests before they're allowed in the building for mm-hmm. physicals and team activities. And so that's what a lesson that the NFL took from other leagues yeah. before you're allowed in the door. Yeah, that's, that's good. And I hope they get it right because I, I feel like, and again, without studies, I just don't understand why nobody's doing this. Just watch a game. Just sit there and watch a game and get people involved in tracking. You know, for soccer, we do heat maps. Give me a heat map for an offensive lineman. Who's around them for that period of time? We know it's not going to be a a wide-ranging heat map, but who are they in contact with? And for how long? Give us that. Let us know what the challenges are and if they can do it. But this part of it, this is consistent across all sports. You've got a test coming in. You can't let the virus in the door to begin with. You've got to do all the things in the way you train, in the way you prepare to train, in the way you work out to socially distance as much as you possibly can in those situations because you can. You don't have to have five people standing at the weight bench. You can avoid that. So avoid it. You know, like you have to think now every time you do something. I do. you You have to. You have to think like, all right, what did my hands touch? Okay, I need to wash my hands here. 
even though that's a lower risk than we thought at the beginning, I'm still going to do it because it doesn't hurt me. You know, it's just anything you can do to stay safer, do it. And these teams have to think that way too. Uh, Katie Weaver was up till two o'clock. Didn't have any coffee yet. I hope she's got some coffee by this point. <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah, cherry Coke energy for me. Um, would it be true to say that L.A. has no chill? Even up by two, they're trying to slip runners in, taking speculative shots. San Jose didn't have any chill either. Um, good teams are. Just ruthless. Just ruthless. You get a chance to to put the foot on a team's neck, you're going to keep doing it. You want to you put them away. You want to handle the game and just end it. And because we've seen it. How many times have we seen it? Where I mean, what did you think when Seattle scored in the first place? Oh boy, here we go. This is going to get interesting. What did you think when RSL scored? Yeah, uh huh. It's it, you have to put teams away. You can't invite that risk. So keep going. If that means you, you put five, six, seven on the board, go for it. Um, while Chara said, uh, I wonder if Eels looked at LAFC and said, "There's no reason we can't be like that." No, I think Darren's smart enough to look at all the different factors in here. And and again, the way everything's been described, they talked on Friday and made the decision on Friday that they would mutually part ways. So I don't think it was just because of the Orlando tournament. I don't think it was just because LAFC's done well without Vela in this tournament and Atlanta didn't do well without Joseph. It's different situations, different rosters, different opponents, so many things that are different, but that's what a lot of people are saying is that, yes, it, it, you can't have that excuse. You can't have the excuse that a player is out. I disagree because I think Joseph is a more irreplaceable player because of the way the rosters are built, because of having Brian Rodriguez for LAFC. Um, you don't have a Joseph. You don't have a player who can replace Joseph. And it shows. And that's maybe one of the problems, one of the knocks on Frank DeBoer in this tournament is that he never figured out how to do that. And he had the training time. Now, he did not have preseason games. And I'm, I will definitely say that that affected the preparation for this tournament for everybody. It showed for everybody. For a team that's trying to replace somebody in this way, I think it's even harder because you need those games to see. Do we work with Adam John better than we work with Manuel Castro or whatever else? You didn't get them, and you didn't figure out the solutions on the fly. So that was part of the equation, but it's not the only part of the equation, in my opinion. Uh, side note, uh, Joel Sherman of the New York Post is now reporting Yankees-Phillies tonight is postponed. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. If you're going to postpone it yesterday, why, are you, why wouldn't you postpone it today already? I mean, that. And then how long are you keeping the, the Phillies off the board? Um, do you not have test results back right now? And, and and that's my guess is that the Phillies would have, and I don't know how are they tested every other day in baseball. I think that was the plan. Um, I want to get this right. Yeah, look it up because I know they're getting results back every couple of days. Like the the Juan Soto one, for example, with the Nationals on opening day, his test was Tuesday. They found out Thursday afternoon yeah it was kind of late in the afternoon that he wasn't going to be able to play so depending on when the Phillies tested and I would assume they probably tested again on Monday you might not have the results from the Monday test so maybe they didn't have the results from whatever their previous test was or the Monday test yet so you're going to wait till you get an all clear but then how many all clears are you going to need them to have and that's the part we don't know. I think it's every other day was the plan, but I know they're, they're not getting their tests back within 24 hours. Right, yeah, the tests are coming back traditionally within 48. Uh, players who test positive, isolated until they test negative twice, at least 24 hours apart, show no symptoms for 72 and receive approval from team doctors, but I've still got to come up with the testing numbers. Um, will you double-check that? I'll keep going. A yeah. uh, bunch of questions about Stephen Glass. Domer, uh, ignorant to Glassy's preferred tactics formation. Does anyone know? No, he's playing what the first team's been playing. Uh, because he's asked, he has to. That's his job. His job is to prepare players to fit into the first team. So we don't know what he will see Atlanta United playing in. So we'll have to wait and see on that. Uh, 22 J Friend. I think 22 J Friend might be a, a new one in the uh, Twitch chat. Hello, 22 J. Uh, how much freedom does the front office give Glass? In, in hmm, 
I think in terms of the on the field, he's the coach. So, you know, he'll have that. I, I think he, he's not going to be asked to play a very defensive style. I don't think that's the case. So if he came in and wanted to play a 5-4-1 and, and sit deep and just bunker, 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 that probably wouldn't be acceptable. But I don't see that as being what he would do. But I don't think they're going to say, no, you have to play 4-3-3 or you have to play 4-2-3-1 or you have to play like this. I don't think that will be the case. Um, wouldn't really make sense for that to be the case, to be honest. So, you know, how much freedom he has to fit within the Atlanta United spectrum, which is to play an attacking style, to want the ball, to play in that way. That's very broad. That can go a lot of different directions. Still looking? Yes, I didn't want people to hear me typing, so that's why I moved it off. So the answer is yes, I'm still looking. Okay. Adam from 816, San Jose Salt Lake was awesome last night. San Jose is fun to watch. San mm-hmm. Jose is just a fun, fun team to watch. Um, it is always on an edge, and it's something that if they're going to make that leap into the elite, for me, the game can't feel as shaky as it did at 2-1 and even at Three one. I think they had a two yeah. goal lead, and it was still like, oh boy, this is not over yet. They've got to find a way to put games away better, and not just by continuing to attack and finding a goal because that leads you to potentially giving up a goal. Got to be careful with that. Um, I think they can get there, but mm, it's still a little shaky at times. Find anything uh, yet? Yeah, multiple daily temperature checks, players and coaches tested every other day. Okay, every other day is a part. The temperature checks, I could care less. Like, really. You can have it and not have a temperature. Uh, That part, I think, I think, again, it's multiple sources of information that are telling you different things on a daily basis, but I, I believe that we are having the understanding that you can be totally asymptomatic and have the virus and be spreading it. So the temperature checks, I guess, are nice, but how much do they really do? In a situation where you're not testing, different conversation. That's one of the only things you have, so you can do that. In a situation where you're testing, I mean, if you're looking for people who are just not feeling well and you want to take all precaution like the Braves catchers, okay, fine. But the testing is the number one thing here. Uh, Kyle Beckerman, yeah, was a little upset. Um, yeah. Domer says, adult Beckerman is way too angry. Needs to go back to reggae Beckerman. I was going to, I don't know if it's, is it reggae? Or, or is it more like counting wilderness? Beckerman. You want to go Counting Crows Beckerman, Adam Duritz? Uh, I'll go wilderness Beckham, Beckerman. Um, he has a little different with the haircut. It, it's a little, it's a little strange, even still, and it's been a while now. Corporate Beckerman. No, it's that's not a corporate haircut. No, it's not corporate. Um, I don't know what it is, but yeah, that was a, that was kind of bad. That red card was <laughs> kind of bad. Uh, Jason Nick says, "Weird that my timeline during the Quakes RSL game was full of these kit combinations are so pretty and colorful <laughs> comments rather than that about the game itself." I, I mean, that's true. That's accurate. They were very nice. Yeah. It, it looked very good. Um, I would have been talking about the game. So, uh, Joe is throwing out formations and trying to break my brain. Thanks, Domer. You're chiming in too. Great. Um, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Shiva says, I want Atlanta to play like LAFC one day. Press the opposition in their own half, wave after wave of attack. I think that's what most fans want also. I'm, and LAFC is not strictly a pressing team. And this is, I think, where we, we get into these philosophical arguments like if you compare if you call LAFC a pressing team and you call the Red Bulls a pressing team I think we understand that they're not the same like they don't play the same way they don't do the same things you can be a team that incorporates pressing but your hallmark is like LAFC to you know they want possession they they want to play in your half when they lose possession they want the ball back as fast as possible the Red Bulls are different. They don't want the ball to begin with. Now they're trying to change that. But classic Red Bulls, New York Red Bulls, they're going to play direct. If they lose the ball in that 50-50, whatever, that's fine. That's going to activate their press. The press is the playmaker for them. And this was what 
Jurgen Klopp's transition went from. His time at Borussia Dortmund, he didn't have a playmaker. He didn't work on creating opportunities. The press created the opportunities. A tactic created the opportunities. Look at Liverpool now. Who's creating the opportunities in his teams? The outside backs. Those are his playmakers. His midfield sits a little bit more. His outside backs are the ones who go. They're the playmakers. They're the ones creating the opportunities. It's not the press doing it. Do they press? Yeah, when the time calls for it. And that's more of LAFC because where I'm surprised is teams have not adopted the Yapstam Cincinnati sit back bunker against LAFC too much yet. They have against Atlanta, and it's hard to deal with. Atlanta has to get better at dealing with it. LAFC hasn't faced it quite as much. When you do that, and this was the, the transition Klopp went from, you know, you talked about it yesterday and how Liverpool was, was patient with him because the early results were not great. I mean, they weren't bad. It was not like yeah. he was stinking it up. But Yeah, they, they weren't fighting for relegation or anything. Well, they finished eighth, yeah. I think, his first full season. I mean, you know, eighth. But they were patient, and he also learned that, look, I'm going to come here. I'm in a different kind of club here. I'm in a different league that plays differently. The German league is a different style, and I've got to adapt. I've got to adapt to teams sitting back and defending against me, and I can't press. There's nothing to press. They don't have the ball, <laughs> so I can't do anything with a press. How can I find ways to win? And he's been able to adapt it. Barcelona in the, the Pep Guardiola heyday, you could say they pressed, but it was more to regain possession after they lost it and they wanted to get numbers forward. If if you're looking for one thing that Atlanta United under Frank DeBoer did not do consistently enough, in my opinion, it was that. When you have the possession and you play in the other team's half and you use the possession to get your team organized, the whole point of it is to then, when you lose possession, immediately press to win it back. Because you have the numbers to do it. That's what LAFC does really, really well. Atlanta didn't do that enough. When they did, I thought they were really good. They didn't do that enough. That's the whole point of the possession. That's the other thing that possession can create outside of creating opportunities through skillful play. You can create those opportunities where in the 3-4-3, for example, um, and I'll try to explain this so you can visualize it a little bit. Let's say in the Columbus game, um, you're working the ball up the right side. You've got Brooks Lennon there. You've got Emerson Hindman drifting over to that side to play. You've got Ezekiel Barco, who has drifted over to that side. And let's say Pitti Martinez was trying to create an overload as well. So you've got four players in the edge of the final third on the right side of the field trying to play a combination to get through Columbus's left back and Darlington Nagby's dropped back to help and the center back's pulled over. So you've got a 4v3. You lose possession. You have a 4v3 defensively now against three. You should be able to win the ball back quickly. That was the Barcelona way. Five seconds, win it back. You don't win it back in five seconds? Okay, then you drop. If you have the possession and you have the numbers forward and you do all that, but you lose possession and you don't immediately press, what is that done? You've made it harder to defend because you have players out of position by not preventing the other team from breaking quickly and transitioning. That's why we talked about transition so much in the tournament in Orlando. Part of that transition is to understand when to step, when to press after losing possession, and when to drop. Atlanta, a lot of times, was caught in between. So I think where LAFC, and you talk about pressing Shiva, it's not the Red Bull style of press, where it's just that's what they do, that's all they do. It's their relentless when they lose possession. Because they want the ball. They want to play with the ball. They want to create opportunities. But when they lose it, they're going to make it difficult for you to play out. That's what LAFC does well. That's something Atlanta can look at because it fits with the way Atlanta wants to play. Atlanta wants the ball. Atlanta's not going to be a, a pressing team that is, we don't care about possession. No, I don't think that's ever going to be the case. You can do both. But you've got to be organized. You've got to have players switched on. You've got to have players willing to put in that work, too. Because that is 
that's a lot of work. And it was something that Lionel Messi struggled with early on at Barca. And Pep at times had to figure out how to protect him from it. I think LAFC does a really good job with their full team and, and not asking Carlos Vela to be going around chasing everything all day. He picks his spots, but a lot of times he drops off. He drops into that second wave. So everybody else will step up and press, create the turnover. Then Vela's free to run and, and, and find the ball and gump, come at you. You have to find the ways to do it, and you have to be organized in how you do it. So that's something that, whether it's Steven Glass in the early going here or long-term, whoever the replacement is, that's an element that we didn't see enough out of Frank DeBoer that has to change. If you're going to be a possession team, you also have to be a team that can disrupt the opposition when they regain that possession. Uh, you all, you want to know who else is willing to uh, put in the work? Who is willing to put in the work? Steve Apolinsky, Apolinsky and Associates. That's what I heard. I heard he likes to uh, press. He, he's very yeah. good in the counter press. Yes, and uh, his, his formations on a daily basis are very, very good at what they do when it comes to wrongful death and serious injury cases. Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for their clients in Georgia and Alabama. If this is something that you need to have uh, looked at, couple different ways that you can do it. Go to the website for Steve Apolinsky at aa-legal.com. The second that that pops up, low right-hand corner, there's a chat window, 24-7, 365 or 366 in a year like this one. If you got questions, you can have them answered instantaneously that way. Or you can fire off an email to Steve individually at S-T-E-V-E, Steve, at aa-legal.com. Or get a free consultation at 404-377-9191. Recognized as legal elite by Georgia Trend Magazine, top 100 firms in the state of Georgia. Home of SDH and the SDH Network's proud supporter of both Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, aa-legal.com. It started out really good. Then you went into the formation thing and threw me. Maybe it's just because of uh, everybody talking about formations and making my head hurt. Uh, breaking news sounder, please. Hi, Dios mio. Breaking news from John Nelson. Sports TV ratings has the final numbers in for the NWSL final on CBS. 653,000 households watched Chicago and Houston at the debut match a few weeks ago on CBS averaged 572,000. So 653,000 households watched the NWSL Challenge Cup final on the CBS Family Network. So that's up from the first game that was on the network, correct? Mm-hmm. By about 18%, it looks like. And that's what you were looking for. That is really impressive. And that's good. I mean, for the games to be outside of game one and the last game to be on CBS, everything was on CBS All Access. It was you know, a lot of word of mouth, um, a lot of promotion within the soccer community for that number to go up after the tournament and for the final, that's great. And it wasn't, I mean, it was a final that didn't have a lot of star power. Let's, let's be real. Houston didn't have any U S women's national team players in it. Chicago had Julie Ertz, Alyssa Nair, but not a lot of household names. And to draw that, that should show you that women's soccer can draw on its own. The, the names are great. The names are a big help, but they're not necessary for this. You can create your own stars. Shea Groom's a star now. Mm -hmm. All over Sports Center, uh, chugging beer out of the trophy. Good I'm times. glad that the trophy survived. I'm blown away that it did. I think there were like five of them, either that or it was plastic. <laughs> There's just no way that that team was going in celebrating that that championship. I have no idea how that thing did not. Lisa break. Baird had a security detail with multiple trophies. Which one's the real one? Oh, oh, this one looks like it's in danger. Here, use this one for the promotion. Yeah, here's the plastic one. Use this. Here's the trophy here. Use this one for your photographs. One, one was, one's built completely of titanium, but it looks like it's made of glass. Yeah. And uh, the real one is probably in a vault someplace in the league office. And, uh, but yeah, and it, it, but it did. But whichever version of the trophy that uh, Houston showed, it did have its own seat on the plane, and it was safely secured by a seatbelt. Well, I mean, that's just, that has to happen. That, that's just a definite. Um, uh, we really don't have a proper sounder for this one, but uh, the news now in Major League Baseball is that the Miami Marlins have four more players who have tested positive. 
Yep, Ken Rosenthal broke that from the athletic a couple minutes ago. Yeah. So uh yeah. Um Adam from eight sixteen says there needs to be a number that if so many positives occur, they call it off. Right now it's really just PR that's making decisions. On a game by game basis, yeah. I, I I do agree with that. Um I it's it's hard. I mean USL championship, they ha and USL League One, they have been correct me if I'm wrong. If a team has one positive in their round of testing pregame, and it's, I think, 48 hours before a game, if they have one positive, no game. That sounds right. Once again, I'll double-check it just to be sure. We've seen postponements, and maybe it's just because they haven't said how many. Yeah. But I believe the release was written to at least give you the impression that there was only one positive. No game. Um, not going to lie, I was surprised that the Nationals played on opening night. And now the Nationals haven't had any other issues. So that is something to keep in mind, is that, you know, for that concern that Soto tested positive on a test on Tuesday, got the results on Thursday, didn't spread through the team. Then you compare it to the Marlins situation where you've had it spread through the team. It goes back to, again, what are the Marlins doing? But I think Adam has a point here, and this will be curious to see how MLS handles this. Now that the genie's out of the bottle, USL doing it is one thing, and it's not to diminish USL, but it is a second tier. It's not a minor league. It's a second tier. People aren't paying as close of attention. Major League Baseball postponing games because of players testing positive helps MLS. Because it's the, it's the best way forward. Look, the game Sunday should have been postponed. I mean, you've got three players you test positive uh, Sunday, or you get the results that they tested positive Sunday morning. You can't play Sunday. The Nationals shouldn't have played last Thursday. Now it's going to be easier for whatever testing MLS does once they go back into markets that you have a positive test, you don't play. You do the same things that Atlanta United did in training. And this is the protocol. This is what everybody's supposed to be doing. Go back to when Atlanta United had two positives in training. Positive on a Wednesday. You got the results back after training. You didn't train on Thursday. You did socially distanced training. You were back to no contact, no interaction. Thursday, you confirmed that the, the positive was accurate. You retested that player. Everybody tested again on Friday. Then you had another positive. Now, Friday, you're still not doing full testing. You're waiting for the all clear to go back to that. You didn't get it on Friday. You had another positive. That was confirmed on Saturday. So you had two positives. You came back Monday. I think there was probably a training session over the weekend that was socially distanced. It's like the, the group training where you're 10 feet apart. One of those deals. And then you come back Monday. Everybody trained or everybody tested. Everybody who tested who was there was negative. You could go back to full team training. You're going to have to follow that. You're going to have to follow that kind of model here for Major League Baseball. You get a positive, you shut it down. Everybody tests. You identify, you identify, you identify. And if that means you got to wait two days before you can play again, before you get those test results, okay. You get another positive, you're back to starting over again. You've got to get to where the group has no positives within it before you can play before you can train normally, before you can have anything contact and interaction. That's what you have to get to. Major League Baseball has got to implement something like that. Uh, Wow, Chara said, don't the Falcons start training today? They, they start, I believe, the process to get to training. They start the testing procedures. I think that's what's happening around the NFL today. I think the quarterbacks might have come in and tested over the weekend, and I think they're kind of phasing people in to come in and test. you got to have two negative tests to start workouts. So it's going to take a few days, I think, to get to that point. But, yeah, I, I, I believe all of that is starting around the league today. Yeah. And the uh, – it's with, – with for me, I'm still looking for the USL championship stuff just to, to give you a heads up. But, yeah, the there, there are – Elements written into the NFLPA uh, agreement that enforce uh, 
prudence, shall we say, because there are game checks on the line if you violate protocols. And, well, that's individual behavior, though, right? Yeah, and and, and, okay. Rook, and Rook and the veterans have taken it on themselves, and the, the veterans and some teams mm-hmm. have come out publicly and said, you know, it's up to us to make sure that the rookies are as vigilant when it comes to following rules and protocols. You know, just because they're new, we have to be that much more vigilant in keeping an eye on them in this current situation because game checks are on the line. Yeah, I know it has to be, and. That's what you do off the field, but it also has to factor into however your whatever the protocols are in the building. If if it's socially distanced, wear a mask. Wear a mask. Period. When you're not performing, okay. If it is socially distanced, okay. If it's you know not eating meals together, okay. Whatever you got to do, it's going to have to be a team effort. And, and that's the one thing that I do have some hope when it comes to American football is that mentality is typical. And, and now you're going to have to have these leaders step up and use that mentality of we are all together, we're a gang, everybody is doing this the same way. You've got to use that in a positive way and deal with this. Because, I mean, Kessie says it, you know, seeing a positive, um, the transmission's already happened. You're trying to mitigate at that point. You've got to identify anybody else and you've got to separate. And you can't have what's happening to the Marlins. Um, just like Dallas, just like Nashville in MLS, and the questions were, well, what happened with those two teams where it didn't happen with others? You've got to identify what broke down. We haven't heard that about Dallas and Nashville. We need to hear that about the Marlins. Every other Major League Baseball team should be demanding those answers. Yep. Because, and, and they need to be honest. <laughs> like, yeah. They need yeah, to they say... Do. What they did wrong, because this can't happen, and there's a lot of people's livelihoods on the line. Because what the Yankees were next in line to play, and they were bringing their own person, they were bringing in their own staff when it came to to clubhouse personnel, and those clubhouse personnel are now part of the equation when the Yankees came to town, and now it, it's you're adding layers to all of this with all the interaction now. You've got to have proper protocols that are fully vetted. You've got to follow these protocols that are fully vetted. And when something goes wrong, because it can, you've got to have the plan to deal with it so it doesn't get worse. And this is a problem. And, I mean, (laughs) Domer, I'm right there with you. Got a feeling that this crap will still be running rampant this time next year. People are stupid. Uh, When you see people at a chain smokers concert when you see people at other concerts when you see people at a house party was it a a, a b&b that had like 700 people or something i mean all this kind of madness it, <laughs> it's not going to go away with that kind of madness it's just not there's just no way around it then then what you're hoping for is you're hoping that these clinical trials on vaccines go really, really well and break every record for getting one produced and getting one you know, shown as safe. And also, alongside that, the therapeutics continue to get better and better and better. If, if people just aren't going to deal with it, that's where all of your, your hopes are going. Because there's politics involved in this. Obviously, we've seen it. Um, it continues. But I'm just going to guess that not everybody who went to the Chainsmokers concert voted the same way. Yeah. And that's a huge issue is, look, it stinks. I, I'm i not the biggest, like, going out and doing all this stuff out and doing all kinds of crazy things. But, yeah, I get a pull. Like, I'd like to go hang out in a patio and have a couple beers yeah it'd be nice i'm not gonna do it right now i'm not gonna do it right now because i wasn't gonna do it before we had games to call um because i'm not gonna put you or mike or miller or anybody else that i'm gonna be in the room with at risk I'm not gonna do that i'm gonna mitigate risk as best i can to protect you guys that's the way we have to think at the moment and if that means we sacrifice some stuff that means we sacrifice some stuff because mm-hmm. otherwise we're si- really then All we're doing is just crossing our fingers that this vaccine trial, and I know they're they're doing a what are they round three, and they're doing some in Savannah, and they're they're doing all over the place. Hopefully that goes really well, and you have a a vaccine by early next year. Um, Hopefully the therapeutics maybe are even faster than that, and you're able to treat people who get it because 
doesn't look like there's much interest in stopping people from getting it. That's not even getting into school. That's not even getting into offices. That's not even getting into anything else. That's just if if as a, a society, if we don't care about this, well, then you're just hoping for a vaccine and you're hoping for therapeutics to be really good really quick. And that's where we're at. And if people aren't going to change their behavior, I don't know what you can do. It's uh, really question, sad. Yeah. A uh, question on Twitter from Bartimus Prime about the octagon. The octagon. Not UFC. No, no. Three things I liked about CONCACAF's new WCQ format and schedule updates. World Cup qualifying. One, every nation has a direct path to the World Cup. Better than the original plan. Two. Better than the original plan, yes. Seven home matches with an exclamation point. Yes. Three. 2021 could see four competitive USA-Mexico matches, Nations League, Gold Cup, and the World Cup qualifiers. Mm Mm-hmm. So those are the three things that Bart liked about the new format and schedule update. It's good for the U.S. because it gives them more margin for error. And they need it. And a lot of teams need it right now. I think the U.S. really needs it. So... It's not going to what some people thought and what was initially reported of three groups of four where you're playing six games instead of ten, which was the original. Now you're playing 14. So you get more mistakes you can make. Uh, You still have to finish top three and now out of eight, but you should be able to handle that. Should being the key part of that. Uh, the games in Mexico are always good. That's going to raise your level. It's going to expose these young players to pressure you're not used to. We'll see how meaningful they are if there's fans in the stands and what all that looks like. We'll have to wait till we get there. But it's good. I I wonder, and I guess my concern is, is going back to all this other nonsense, are you going to have these dates get pushed back? Because, I mean, are you going to be able to play World Cup qualifiers in the first round with – Curacao and whoever they get drawn with, Nicaragua. You going to be able to play that game in October? I don't know. And if you don't, then what? Like, there's not any extra dates. Like, this is slammed into the, the calendar, and it is what it is. If you have delays at the, at the front end of it, how are you going to get this done? And I don't, I don't know if there's an answer to that. So instead of going the route, which if you want to be safe and create a structure where, okay, you create open dates for friendlies, or if you have to push things back because of all this, then you've got cover. Now I don't know how much cover you have, and I'm not positive, not, I'm not optimistic about games in World Cup qualifying situations being played in CONCACAF in October. Now, the U.S. would not be playing in those. That's the first round where Canada, for example, how's Canada going to play Trinidad and Tobago? No, they wouldn't play them. How's Canada going to play Bermuda right now? Bermuda's going to have to come in and quarantine for 14 days. How do you, you can't do that. Yeah. Like So, and it's October. It's not that far off. I just don't know how it gets done. Um, the format on paper, yeah, I like it. It gives the U.S. more of a chance to qualify. More games means the better teams should go through, and the U.S. is one of the better teams in the region. And you get the Mexico games, all that. It, I'm I'm good with what Bart said. I'm just worried about the feasibility of actually completing the thing. Yeah, yeah. And when you when you mentioned Canada as one of the teams in the group, I mean, with the isolation that they have right now, with MLS franchises and with the Toronto Blue Jays becoming the Buffalo Blue Jays. I mean, the the logistics of countries and what they're allowing and travel and quarantine. I mean, it's it's something that has to be put into this rather large equation about trying to get things done. And I mean, this the schedule for me is if everything goes according to plan and is perfect then this is what we have. If one thing goes wrong, if that one domino gets pulled out of place, if if the Jenga that's set up, if somebody pulls the wrong peg, then that whole that whole castle just goes <clears throat> and then you got to figure out how you're going to do it again. It's going to be rough. Um we'll see. Fingers crossed on that. Adam from 816 about 
positive tests and all that. Um, there's a fine line between holding those who test positive accountable, but also not stigmatizing, shaming them. That's true. Um, some of it's down to what they did. Um, if they know, and that's the thing, they might not know. Um, Lou Williams, for example, that's one where, okay, maybe it's a little over the top. And also maybe people don't understand how good the wings are at magic city. Uh, they are on postmates by the way. Um, Props to Magic City for taking advantage of all this publicity and creating mm-hmm. a Magic City Kitchen account on Twitter and getting on Postmates and uh, what's, the, what's the other one they're on? DoorDash. Uh, DoorDash. They're on DoorDash and Postmates. Uh, if you want to find out how good those wings are, well, there you go. Um, but Lou Williams doing that, not really smart when he's about to go back into the bubble, and that's why you create this. So that's why I think he was talked about quite a bit. Um, if it's like the situation, I can't remember the goalkeeper's name. It was a Bournemouth goalkeeper, right? Who tested Aaron positive. Hinsdale, who went to, who just went to the shop. Yeah. He said, yeah, the only thing I've done is I went to the shop. Um, if it's a situation like that, then yeah, it's a different conversation. Um, I think it's down to the, what happened if they know. And it, it is really difficult when you've got, you know, media trying to scramble to find out who tested positive, um, Sometimes you're going to find out because they're not in the lineup, for example. But in a situation like this, like who was the first one? I don't know if you're ever going to find that out. I don't know if you're ever going to figure that out. And the Marlins probably need to, but yeah. I don't know if you're going to be able to because of the timeline with it. And and Adam's right. You know, it it, it is a balance. Um, if somebody is doing reckless behavior, I think they need to be called out. But just testing positive doesn't necessarily mean that it was reckless behavior. Yeah. And that's the hard part about this. That's the part that you can do everything right and you can still get it. Yep. Uh, since you mentioned Bournemouth, let me drop this in real quick. Okay. Uh, looks like Bournemouth, is their, their board might be getting together to discuss a claim against Hawkeye. What? Yeah. The, uh, you remember the first game that uh, the Premier League had when they came back for Project Restart, the the, the Aston Villa-Sheffield United game where you had yeah. Hawkeye completely and totally just <clears throat> over the, the ball. You like that the... noise today, jeez. <clears throat> well, it's, it's apropos. For we are the BBC News Service. They don't like that noise. <laughs> no, not now. So wait a minute. So Bournemouth is going to... Have they filed a suit? Are they threatening they're, to file a suit? They're, they're thinking about it. They're, they're thinking about it. The game had nothing to do with them. Right. What, what did it, it affect? Okay. What was the effect of it? The effect was Villa getting points and then uh, getting the 1-1 the one, one draw. So that okay. one point would bring Villa even with Bournemouth, and I think Bournemouth had a better goal difference. Okay. So they're saying that a Hawkeye, and was this the one? Wait, what part of the the conversation was it? Was it about that that situation where Hawkeye got screened by so many different people involved, and it was the first time that had ever happened? Yeah, their their catastrophic failure of of not being able to see what happened. It wasn't detected by their their goal line technology <laughs> system, even with all the cameras and the video that was right there that could have been seen. By everyone but that's different. No, 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 no. And that, that was what I wanted you to say. I, I'm glad you read my mind because you just ruined Bournemouth's case. Oh, of course. Because Bournemouth is suing the Hawkeye technology yeah. about it breaking you're not down. Suing, you're not suing VAR because or you can't. PGMOL. I'm sure they can't do that. Um, I'm sure it's part of the licensing agreements of being part of the league. They can't do that. But that's what happens. It becomes a referee decision when you don't have the technology and the referee messed up the referee trusted the technology the technology was wrong i don't think you're getting anything out of the suit you're definitely not getting your point you're definitely getting relegated stop being foolish um it stinks it's a bad referee decision but it's the same as a bad referee decision on sending somebody off when they shouldn't have you can't sue over that yeah uh bournemouth would have had a better goal difference by one if that point had not been in play for Aston Villa. 
Jason Nix with a question. I know both the Falcons and United sent out emails to season ticket holders regarding attending games. Do you guys think there will be fans at United Games in 2020? Mm. I think there will be. Um, Later in the year, not immediately. That's where my head's at. Is We don't know what's going to happen later in the year, um, but I think the chances are greater down the road for fans to be in the stands than they are right now. Um, it's tough because you're dealing with other groups. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one of the weirdest things to me about calling the game from Kennesaw last time with the twos was empty stadium. It's weird to begin with, but we get the job done. We call the game, get in the car, driving home, drive by um, uh, Twin Peaks right there on the corner, packed, packed with people packed down the street. So it's this weird thing of, okay, you have the pro sports game over here. They're being responsible. They're not having fans in the stands right now. Down the street, long walk, yeah. Twin Peaks, bar, inside, packed. Drive home, get off the, the interstate and nightclub right there packed people everywhere <laughs> I, I mean it's just it's it's bizarre and i don't know what the right answers are at this point um yeah. because you know when other businesses are saying well we're just we're open because we're trying to make money and stay in business and you have this game that has no fans in the stands because they're trying to do it their way and be responsible who's right who's wrong should you if everybody else is doing it, should you? Should you find a way to do it safely? I don't know. I, I don't have the answers to this. I don't know when you get outside of a testing environment, which the teams are in, I don't know what you can do safely. And, I mean, I understand that in a stadium like that, and in a stadium like Mercedes-Benz, you can socially distance. You can, as an individual, you can stay away from people. You can limit your risk. All that's good. The more people that are in the venue, the harder that gets because you can't control everybody else's behavior. Right. And that's what's so hard about it is, I don't know. I, I, I think it's going to be hard not to depending on what happens in society around it. Um, and as we've said from the beginning, if the NFL allows it, United will as well. Because if you didn't, just as much people who are going to criticize even having the option for people to be in the building, if the Falcons did and United didn't, people would go nuts. Yes. You're stuck in a lot of ways. And it's it's not an easy decision on any front of it. But I do think there will be, if there is a remainder of the season and it goes like the calendar that they're talking about, and you have a final in mid-December, I think you could have fans in the stands by the end. You won't have full capacity, no way. But you could have fans in the stands by the end. Um, not a large number. And I think a lot of people will opt not to go. And I completely and utterly understand that. Um, I'm the same way. The more people that are in the building, the more I'm going to be like, all right, how can I avoid anybody that I don't know? <laughs> You know, if it's, okay, they're going to open the gates uh, 90 minutes before the game or they're going to stagger it, maybe people can even go in earlier than that to try to go in first and not go in with a crowd. I'm going to make sure I'm in the building before anybody else is, and I will wait till everybody else is out of the building before I leave. Like, I will do whatever I have to do to, to limit my exposure to anybody. So it is what it is. Um, I don't have the answers. I wish I did. I wish somebody did. I don't think anybody does at the moment. Yeah, Colonel says that uh, he thinks there'll be fans in the stands in 2020. He will not be one of them. Yeah, and I know a lot of people who, who won't be, and I know people who will be. Um, again, I, I don't have the right answer here. I don't know what's, what it is. Um, I know the reality, and this is something that, I know it's easy if you want to get on a soapbox and 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 make points and try to score points to forget 
this is a business that's three plus years old now and they've done really really well and their owner is somebody who has a lot of money and he's given a lot of money right now to a lot of different causes uh but this is a business that can't function as a normal business at the moment and luckily you know we haven't been affected by it um luckily nobody that i know of has been affected by it um there hasn't been any cuts other teams in this league have had cuts Mm-hmm. Uh, the longer you go without anybody in the stands and just trying to function, um, the harder it gets for that to be the case. That, that's that's just reality. Um, everything is hard for anybody right now. It's a school. It's difficult. It's a, a bar, restaurant. It's difficult. It's a brewery. It's difficult. It's a office. It's difficult. It's a you know, a law office, it's difficult. Um, it's a government agency, it's difficult. All of it is. Uh, sports are no different. And everybody's trying to find a way to deal with this. And it's it's really hard, and I don't know how it's going to change. And that's the part that's maybe the scariest, is, you know, you saw what other countries did very early on. Is that going to happen here? No. It would have happened sooner. If you are going to have a shutdown like Italy did, it needed to happen when we halfway shut down March. Yeah. Which helped. I mean, that helped, but did it fix it? No, just delayed it. And now we're dealing with that mistake. You're not going to shut everything down now. I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, should it? Yeah, probably. Uh, but then how are you going to deal with all the businesses that are probably going to go out of business because of it? Because you've pushed everything back. I, I don't know. I, again, I don't know what the best way forward is because you do have to factor in both sides of it. You have to. You can't just say that, okay, shut it down. That's the only way to deal with this. Well, then how do you deal with all the other things from it? Because you have to deal with that too. And I don't know. And when now you're debating about what unemployment looks like and stimulus payments and they can't get something done and it's just it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, and I don't know when we're waking up. You mentioned what it means to uh, large markets. Small markets uh, impacted even more so. But uh, Tormenta back on the field tonight, the rescheduled game with Richmond. Uh, If I'm not mistaken, it's 10% capacity that they have at Eric Russell Park. So it's uh, roughly crowds of about 400 that uh, are going to be right now seeing action in Statesboro. And you, you mentioned Arthur Blank. I mean, think of Darren Van Tassel and what he's been investing and in wanting to do with building of Tormenta and the, the stadium that, that he's trying to build on the clubhouse property and what he means and what Tormenta has meant to the fabric of not just Statesboro, not just Bullock County, but that section of the state and the part of the footprint. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's larger when you get into places like USL League One and those owners who've invested so much on their local levels, too. And it's different. I mean, Statesboro and Atlanta, Metro Atlanta, are two very different places. Very different kinds of challenges dealing with this. Um, A lot of USL championship and League One markets are, are very different than some of the challenges that MLS markets are facing. So there's not a one size fits all answer. And I don't think that's going to emerge from this. Um, Atlanta Phoenix. What I love about sports restarting is how much soccer I've been able to watch. I've never been able to watch all the MLS teams play outside of their matches with Atlanta. This past month, I've seen all 24 um, MLS teams multiple times. I've always made sure to catch as much USL and NWSL as possible. We'll never take soccer for granted again. Yeah, I'm the same way. Like I'm, I'm waiting to see what this looks like from a soccer industry standpoint i mean youth clubs what what's that gonna look like the youth soccer tournament industry the camp industry got you know obliterated this summer a lot of people make their living off of those camps off of the tournaments they run off of registration fees at clubs and all of that is up in the air all of that is a mess right now so it's all levels um where you can support whatever your club or where your kids play or whatever, wherever you can support it if you're able to. 
it's vital right now because I don't know where the light at the end of the tunnel is for those groups. I really don't. Um, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how that goes. Uh, Percy Herrera hanging out. And Percy Herrera has a question. He is asking for thoughts on the rumored uh, Sebas Perez interest. Yep. Um, this popped up in uh, Dirty South Soccer's got it in English, but um dot com has it. He is from Boca Juniors, twenty seven. Um, hasn't played a ton there. Boca has a ton of talent, and sometimes guys get lost in the shuffle. Defensive midfielder. His contract expires in twenty one. He is reportedly looking for a move out of Argentina, um, according to Toto Fichajes. It's Atlanta, it's Inter Miami, and it is uh, Braga in Portugal that are interested in him. Um, Toto Fichajes is, is one that, I mean, if I'm ranking my tiers of, of sources, they're not at the top of it. Uh, it's a little more hit or miss. So I'm not going to get into specifics here. I think the two things that jump out is you've been linked to two players lately, if you're Atlanta United, and Jonathan Gonzalez and Sebastian Perez, both defensive midfielders. Uh, Gonzalez can play as, as an eight as well, but both holding midfielders. That's a position you have a lot of players in. But obviously, at least from the rumor perspective, there is an interest in upgrading in that position. Um what the roster looks like because of this, I don't know. I have to see. But would he be a a good fit? Sure. Um, on paper, yeah, it'd be a good fit. Depends on the price. Um, he's twenty seven. You know, he's kind of in that. He's kind of in that like Eric Rometty, uh, Leandro Gonzalez, Perez kind of guy coming in. You're not looking for a resale on the other side. You're you're bringing him in because you think he's going to upgrade your team. Uh, being at Boca. Definitely good. He spent time on loan in Pachuca and Liga MX. Um, it depends on the numbers. It depends on the price. What I'm wondering when the Gonzalez stuff hit is, are you going to see moves of players in that position going out yeah. and what that could look like? So we'll have to wait and see. It, this window is going to be so crazy. The part where about Perez looking for a move out of Argentina, that's going to happen right now. And, and that's Boca is maybe one of the clubs that's going to happen the least. But, the economy in Argentina is in a huge mess. And the clubs outside of Boca and maybe River, and that's still a maybe when it comes to River, are in a very bad situation. You probably do have players who want out and want to get out of the country. Um, I think you're going to have a lot of sales from Argentina out. And what that looks like for MLS teams... You know, it goes back to what we were talking about before. Um, what are your revenues going to look like this year? How much can you invest at this moment? Some teams won't be able to. Some teams, they'd love to go out and spend in this window. They might not really have the juice to do it. Atlanta obviously would. Miami obviously would. There's others who would. They'll have the resources to do it, and they'll be able to go out and take advantage of this market because this market's going to be crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, the flip side is, like we said, in the holding midfield, You've got Eric Rometty, you've got Jeff Lorenowitz, you've got Emerson Hindman, you've got Mo Adams, you've got, who am I forgetting, um, Mateo Sosatu factors in there. That's not getting into Anton Walks, you could play in there if you needed him to, Fernando Meza could play in there if you needed him to. It's not getting into those. But you've got a lot of players, and if you're looking to add another, is that a bit of foreshadowing that you're going to play three in the middle of the midfield. Now, you'd think one of those would be Pitti or Barco. You wouldn't play three holding midfielders. You could. And Jonathan Gonzalez is a player who could play at the, the tip of two other holding behind. I think Heinemann could play in that role as well. Could you? Sure. It's possible. I guess where, where my head's at is after last season, I thought they needed to upgrade at the six. Um, they didn't. I think it's still an issue. I think also they're having to, not having to, they're exploring potential good purchases right now. If Jonathan Gonzalez is available, young player who is, is a little more in line with a young player who could potentially end up being a Mexican international, who could also be a transfer out at some point down the road. Perez would be different. Perez could just be a good purchase. 
by you know from a club that is looking to sell and a player who's looking to move. You got to weigh all that. I think Atlanta, from these rumors, what I take out of it, Atlanta will be a player in the upcoming window. I think they have to be. Um, yeah. Not because the roster is bad, but because it can be upgraded, and because now you're going to have an opportunity to upgrade in some big ways. And that's where you're at. So if it's Perez, which we'll have to wait and see there's more on, if it's Gonzalez, if it's somebody else completely, keep an eye on it. I think Atlanta will be a player both incoming and outgoing. Yeah, I was going to mention, you mentioned incoming, but because of the interest of, uh, we've talked about Ezekiel Barco and, and Europe and specifically Italy. So, you know, if, if, you're a, if you're a player for both inbound and outbound traffic, I mean, you just have to make sure that you're keeping an eye on both and don't neglect one when you're looking at information. So, yeah, when I saw the thing with uh, uh, Seba come across this morning, I was checking his agents and seeing who their other clients are to see if there's any kind of crossover with uh, leagues anywhere close. But... Uh, Nothing here domestically. The closest is uh, they have Edwin Cardona as a client, and his current club is Sholos, and that's about as close as we get. Uh, Shiva said, changing the subject, what was one thing that you think Atlanta United did to make themselves a global brand? One million Twitter followers. While I guess it is safe to say no other team has been able to do that. Um, hmm, One thing. One thing. I'm trying to think of one. I well, don't... I mean, for me, I guess I would phrase it as just being media savvy and not turning down an interview That's opportunity. Fine. Darren with his history back in England. Any time that, that when he first started to, to hop on the job, folks in England, whether it was Sky or BBC or whomever, would want to talk to Darren about what's going on with his new job because of his Spurs ties. And so anytime anybody wanted to talk to anyone in the front office with Atlanta United, you know, Darren or whomever, they were more than willing to do that. So I think that putting themselves out there to explain their vision early on, for me, regardless of where it was on the planet, and you still had those past relationships, I think that that was big to, to put yourself out there for folks to sit there and say, yeah, this is what we're up to this day, these days, and this is who we are, and this is who we want to be. See, the question's hard because Shiva's asking for one thing. Atlanta Phoenix had multiple answers, which is where my head would be. Uh, Tata right. Martino hiring him, uh, the Miguel Almiron sale, I think the Miguel Almiron purchase as well. Um, record-breaking crowds um, all played a part. If I had to go to one, I would say maybe the crowds. Yeah. Because that seemed to be the thing that crossed over from, okay, this is uh, Miguel Almiron, a player who's going to go to Europe, or Tata Martino's a, a manager who was with Argentina and Barcelona. You know, those got play, but in terms of being a worldwide brand, I think the crowds. I think yeah. the, the crowds is what did it because it, it shocked a lot of people around the world. When I talk to people from around the world, even around the country, it's typically the first thing that comes up is, you know, how are they drawing all these people? How is that happening? It's not supposed to happen in Atlanta. Well, it is. Yeah. So I think that's it. That's what I will go. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a, that's a pretty solid play because right now it's, what, the, the top 10 largest crowds in the history of the league right now are Atlanta United? Yeah. Sorry, Percy, to disappoint with a non-soccer talk earlier. My bad. Um, Look, I'm. I'll just. I'll tell you all this. I'm worried about what the rest of the season looks like because of what's happening in baseball and the rest. So sometimes we cross over into other things. I'm sorry if that's uh, frustrating for some. My bad. Um, and we're getting to the Twitch timeline, so yes, we do get behind. So sorry, guys. Uh, sorry to disappoint. Okay, um, Shiva, uh, going back and forth about that. Tata's one, Miguel's one. I think it's the fans, though. I just. I. I think it's the fans. Um, I think that is the number one thing that made this a big deal. It's the thing that crosses from players, coaches, brand, um, logo, stadium. I mean, and, and maybe the stadium factored into it to a degree because that gets a lot of play worldwide. But, yeah, I think it's just literally the attendance. I think that's the biggest thing that has made this a global brand. Now, how you got the attendance is another topic. Yeah. Because I think that comes down to the way you branded the club initially, some of the signings you made, all of the media friendly, the media savvy, all of that factored into it. But 
What made it a global brand? The amount of people in the building. Starting at Bobby Dodd and then Mercedes Benz. Yeah. When you have that first impression that that first came out of the blocks where I know that there were a lot of folks who outside of Atlanta were unsure what the crowd was going to look like for that first match at Bobby Dodd. And then the players themselves said when they stepped out and saw the place was packed and it was loud and it was raucous and they were on top of you, they realized that they were part of something that could be very, very special. And it's turned out to be that. Yeah, it has. Um, Games tonight, MLS. So last of the round of 16. Yep. Get your numbers out. We got Columbus and Minnesota. At eight o'clock, they're they're messing with me on the time frame. Um, I know. Columbus and Minnesota at eight, not eight thirty. Portland yeah. and Cincinnati at ten thirty, not eleven. Right. Man, that last game might put you to sleep. Uh, let's go with the first one. <laughs> Columbus plus one hundred five, according to BetMGM. Minnesota plus two fifty. This is a sneaky good game. Mm-hmm. Sneaky and- good game. And actually, depending on where you look, the aggregate from our friends at Odds Portal have Columbus at even money, but there are some places that have Columbus as a favorite. 102, minus 102, well, minus 105. Columbus is a favorite. Has, well, I mean, it's as opposed to the plus, 10, plus 105 or plus 100, you actually have negative numbers. Right. Okay. With uh, Bet at Home, Bet 365, and Bet Joe. Bet Joe has them at minus 114, actually. So the aggregate from our friends at Odds Portal have Columbus hmm. at plus 100, even money. Yeah, plus 105, according to Bet MGM. Uh, that Minnesota number is interesting. Um, Minnesota, I thought, would struggle more in this tournament without Ike Para. They've been able to handle that pretty well. Jose Aja has been, been all right. Uh, Backline, Gasper, Boxall, Aha, Metanair. Metanair is as good as it gets it right back. You get help in front of them with Alonzo, with Gregush. Um, Hassani Dotson can drop deep as well. And that front three, um, there was a lot of disappointment with Robin Lord last season. He's been good with this group. Finley is healthy and effective on the right wing, and Luis Amaria is legit up top. Yep. Now, this game for me is one in the midfield because Columbus, if everybody's healthy and it appears that they are, with Lucas Zellerion, with Artur, with Nagby, the question I've had about Columbus is what happens if a team is able to control possession and put pressure defensively on Artur and Nagby? We haven't seen it really in this tournament yet. I don't think you're necessarily going to see it here because I think Minnesota is going to look to get out wide. But can you pre- prevent Zellerion from hurting you? Uh, it's going to be down to Alonzo and Gregush, specifically. I think Columbus wins it, but I don't think it's easy. Yeah. I don't think it's easy at all. I think it's a, a really hard-fought, like, 2-1 kind of game. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked if Minnesota won at all. I'm not, I wouldn't touch it from a, no. a picking a winner and putting money on it standpoint. No, I, I actually have this one going to PKs. I think that, uh, and then it comes down to how you act in the the five frames. But no, I've got Columbus winning it, but I think it goes to PKs. Yeah, I do too. Um, or I, no, I think Columbus wins it, but I think it's tight. Uh, Portland and Cincinnati. Portland overwhelming favorite. Bet MGM minus one thirty four. Cincinnati plus three three thirty three. Hmm. Hmm. I don't think it's going to be pretty. Uh, Portland has to do something they've struggled to do and break teams down. When teams have sat back and defended against them, they've struggled. And Cincinnati's going to continue to do that because that's all they can do right now. Yeah, Um, That's just all they have. Can Portland do it? They have the the people, too. I mean, Diego Valeria, Sebastian Blanco, all you need is one moment of magic from them. And I think they'll find it. But I think it'll be a very frustrating game. Um, yes. I don't think it'll be a fun one to watch. I think it's 1-0 Portland yeah. goal in the 60th. Uh, I do think Portland wins it. I'd be yeah. pretty surprised if they don't find a way to do that, but it won't be easy for them. No, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think that it's going to be a grinder. Uh, you know, for, for folks like you and me and Katie Weaver, who stayed up late last night, uh, I think that this might be the cure for that. 
Yeah, that's going to be rough. And I, and I like uh, Savarese and all, but oof. And the winner of that one gets NYCFC in the next round. Yeah, it probably depends on what uh, what nap time looks like today. <laughs> that's yeah. what it's going to come down to for that one. Uh, okay, we'll finish up on Twitch and Twitter as we wrap up. Shooter right is a uh, little disappointed as well. Um, good to see you, Shooter. Uh, New England, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the revolution and that game of Philadelphia, but... Shooter's worried about the season, which I think anybody has to be with what's going on in Major League Baseball. We just have to find out more. Uh, I do think that this is a Marlins issue right now. If the Phillies start to have positives, I think they're in real trouble. Yeah. If you have that one team going to another issue, then you're in big trouble. It hasn't happened yet, and we'll see what happens. But, yeah, you have to be worried. You have to be worried right now. Uh, four card Ahmed says, are the fans coming back next season regardless, or there'll be a big drop off if not a successful run rest of the year, early playoff exit. I do think the fans will come back. Um, <laughs> once you're able to come back in full, because I think we've seen it with TV ratings, yes. you know, people have been hungry for normalcy where you can find it in whatever version of normalcy you can find. So I think when people are able to come back, regardless of the results this year, you'll have it back. I do think that'll happen. I don't think results will will kill that off. The thing that would be concerning is not so much results, but more of you know the economics effect, effects of this. You know, are are people going to not have as much disposable income? Those kinds of things that would affect it more than worries about results, in my opinion. Uh, Ricky Ricardo said, Ben Bear from MLSsoccer.com on 92.9 earlier today did not think we'd get anyone from the Extra Time crew on local radio. Why not? happens it's all good um we've had let's see so far lately uh we got dylan butler on the tournament preview show he's not an extra time guy but he's an mls soccer guy yeah. uh ben on i guess it would have been the morning show although it could have been uh andy and randy depends on when ricky heard that i i did not know he was going to be on uh, that's a good call from the producers who booked him. And uh, Lexi Lawless was on Friday with Dukes and Bell. So, you know, trying to branch out, trying to have more. Um, you know, I, I know you all get sick of hearing me all the time. So trying to have more voices. And you need those national voices, too, because they have a different perspective than we do looking at it, you know, from the inside or from the side of it a lot of times. And it's good to have Alexi come in and, and give his opinion. And he's very opinionated. Yes. And to have Ben and to have Dylan and to have others come on. So it's going to continue. Taylor's been on the, the station plenty of times. It's going to continue. There's no vendetta against the Extra Time crew. Um, that got really way overplayed last year. <laughs> Four Card Ahmed says, uh, I know I opted out for the rest of 2020 and hope to be back early next year. I, I think that's going to be common. Uh, I do expect that to be common. Um, let's see here. Uh, four card says, not sure if they're coming back to 65 to 73,000 without good results and a good end of 2020. I don't think it factors in at all. I, I think maybe there's more pressure to start the new season when you're able to have those big crowds. But I do think the first time you can have a big crowd, it'll happen. Um, yeah. if it doesn't, I think it's more about the economic effects, to be honest. Yeah, I think season opener 2021 in a perfect world, you open it up to the full house. Um, Percy, I think this was answered correctly. I think if not, John has it. Uh, does everyone that opted out of this season get to renew for next year, or did they forfeit their season tickets? They didn't uh, they, forfeit, right? No, they were allowed to go to 21. Okay, you could push it back to 21. It was basically an opt-in for this year. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't truly an opt-out. Got it. Well, yeah. Wanted to make sure of that. Uh, Atlanta Phoenix is predicting Minnesota getting by in penalties, and Portland went in by two. Okay. Hmm. I don't know if Portland – well, Portland could absolutely win by two. If I had to pick one that's more likely, I'll go Portland winning by two. Yeah. Uh, Minnesota, the way you beat Columbus right now, you get an early goal. It's the absolute key to beating Columbus. You get an early goal to where that midfield has to take more chances because they're not built to sit back and they're not built to have anybody hold back. You know, Nagby's going to want to go. Our tour definitely goes to chase the game. And if you get 1v1 situations against either one of them when they're chasing, trying to find an equalizer, you like your chances because they're not great 1v1 defenders, either one of them. So 
you get an early goal, you can change it against Columbus. And that hasn't happened in this tournament yet. I don't think that's happened at all this season. Uh, I know it didn't happen against NYC. They had an early red card. Hasn't happened in this tournament. The Seattle game that was a draw, I think Seattle equalized to make the draw. I don't think Seattle scored first in that one. I think Columbus did. So get an early goal and see how they react. And and Minnesota can do that. Amaria can absolutely do that. Katie Weaver is hoping that the Philly Fanatic is spared from the outbreak. Well, I think that with uh, the Fanatic's belly, I think that there is built-in social distancing. (laughs) I don't know if it's six feet. But I think the fanatic did stay in the the crowd during all of this with the cardboard cutouts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see here. Do 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 do. Um, Percy, you can get the. Uh, thank you, Jason. Nick's already sent you the link. <laughs> the uh, NWO inspired shirt is available yes. on Teespring. Um, thanks to Chris Ashley for setting that up for us. So you can get it in black. You can get it in red. You can get it in gray. All three are available. You can even get a fanny pack if you want, Percy. There you go. It's there. Uh, it was the morning show that had been bare. Thank you. Lots of conversation here. I did not. Oh, I did see Rob Stone's tweet, Ricky Ricardo, about 2026, and I didn't see anything to confirm that. Rob Stone said that there would be eight CONCACAF teams in the World Cup in 2026. The three hosts would get in and then five more. Now, 26 is where you're going to 48 teams. Right. Eight feels excessive yeah um i would assume that's saying that Concacaf will get eight going forward in a 48 team tournament and just three of them are going to the hosts which feels like a lot i mean right now you're getting three and a half because one goes into the playoff i thought you might get six that was kind of where i thought you'd go and even that felt maybe like a stretch because You look at CONCACAF team's success in the World Cup. Mexico hasn't gotten past the round of 16 in any tournament that they didn't host. Uh, The U.S. got past the round of 16 when they beat Mexico in 2002. Costa Rica got to the round of 16 in 2014. I I think they got to the quarterfinal. Yes, they did. In 2014. Um, They've gotten out of the group before. That's about it. So why wouldn't other continents get more? Unless you just don't want to give a whole lot more to Europe and you're just trying to spread the wealth. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's the approach. I want to see the full breakdown before I get too worked up. But it feels like a big jump for CONCACAF in general. Maybe it's just because you got three hosts. And going forward, it'll be more like five or six. And that would feel about right. Eight feels wild. I mean, if you took the top eight teams in CONCACAF right now and you put them in, it would be your your three hosts that would go, but it'd also be, uh, man, I don't have it in front of me. Um, Curacao, I know, would be one. Um, Honduras would be one. I think Panama possibly would be one. Trinidad and Tobago could be one. Yeah. Uh, You're going to get some teams that are going to maybe struggle. Costa Rica would be the other one. You're going to get some teams that might struggle in that. But it's a 48-team tournament, so who knows? Yeah. Are, are we officially in stoppage time? We are officially in stoppage time. Okay. I've got to go take care of a dog. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, we'll wait till John gets back since he has to go do something. I don't know what he's exactly going to do. Uh, if he's going to walk his dog trooper, it's going to take a minute. So uh, eight was not what I expected, Ricky, for CONCACAF. I thought it'd be less. Four card says Yop Stam will play 10 in the box. Cincinnati will progress on penalties. <laughs> Hashtag boring chaos. I will not make it through that game. If, if that's how it goes down, I will not be able to make it through that game. I will be asleep by the time we get to the 60th minute. That's where my head's at. Uh, and that scares me and saddens me too. Um, Michael Head on Twitter, I uh, completed the season ticket survey indicating I'd be willing to attend matches this season. I guess I'm in the minority, but would love to attend a match at MBS or even a twos game at the Fraction. It's it's down to what you're individually comfortable with. And, and I know I know Colonel isn't. Um, I know others aren't. And I know some who are. So it's all down to what you're comfortable doing. And that's where I guess everything is right now. If 
whatever you're comfortable doing in general. Uh, Atlanta Phoenix on CONCACAF. My thought is eight teams just because of the three-nation hosts. Uh, since we'll see many co-hosted tournaments going forward, I think the number of bids per confederation will be very fluid going forward. That's a good shout. That could be it. I don't know if you'll see many three-country hosting situations, but you'll see twos. Uh, you'll, see, you'll see duos. I think Spain and Portugal could be one that you get. Um, you could see... Belgium and the Netherlands potentially, although a 48-team tournament, I don't know if they would even be able to handle that. Maybe they would need a third to get in. Um, you could see the, the U.K. as a whole, I think, host Australia, New Zealand, like we're going to see in the Women's World Cup in 23. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe the, maybe you're just allocating at least two spots for hosts going forward, and then you figure the rest out each tournament. And maybe they change that equation for each tournament based off results, and I think they should. If the African countries start to emerge more and get to deeper runs in the tournament, they should get more qualifiers, period. Mm -hmm. Uh, If Europe has a whole bunch of qualifiers, if they're the best teams, they're the best teams. Um, Are you going to put all of South America in? I mean, you just (laughs) don't even worry about qualifying your South Americans so you get in the house. I don't know. Are you going to make eventually, and this is what I kind of wonder, if you really start to make it fluid with bids, do you make CONMEBOL and CONCACAF have qualification together? Because, I mean, if you're going to give eight spots to CONCACAF, to justify that, you should be giving everybody in South America a spot. Yeah. And you don't want to do that. So how do you handle it? I don't know. Yeah, I could easily see a scenario down the road, and it's probably 10 to 20 years away, where you make CONCACAF and Ball qualify together for almost like a European type of number of spots, maybe a little bit less. And everybody has to go in. And then you might have a qualifying game at La Bombonera in, in Buenos Aires against Argentina. You might have to go to Caracas and play Venezuela in a qualifier. I don't know how else you do it because you're going to get to a point that otherwise you're just letting South America in, no questions asked. A uh, couple of uh, other points here. Michael Head. I already said, got it. I already got it. Oh, you got- Okay, cool. Well, then I won't talk about Michael Head. <laughs> thanks, Michael. Um, my, thanks, Michael. Um, and uh, we're caught up on Twitter, but I do have a kicker whenever you're ready. Oh, you're... and uh, you got something over your left shoulder that uh, folks have occasionally seen as you've drifted. Yeah, I drift. I move around. Um, I'm still trying to wake up a little bit. Uh, the Charleston Battery sent us a kit. And let me turn this way because of the way my headset is. And it has SDH and 20 on it, obviously, but it is one of their new kits um, as a thank you for our Charleston Battery show that you and Poppy do on a regular basis. So yeah. Charleston's been a big supporter, and we appreciate them very, very much. Yes, it's very, very cool. And uh, I have the, the scarf as a part of the, the scarf rotation. It is It is back there. It is not in view, and I would have to dismount and b- grab it and bring it back. Well, you need to put it in a more prominent spot. True, I do. Uh, I just have to figure out where that is, considering that the sho- that the shower, uh, the towel rack here is is pretty well covered, and you're gonna have to rotate. I think, that, yeah, I'm getting to that point. Much like the 250 hats that we have down here. You, you're gonna States. you're gonna have to keep mixing it up. I mean, I added a few new scarves, you know, mix it, mixing up the look a little bit, trying to do some different things. So, oh. yeah, you, you got to rotate because you can't just bury scarves, John. Oh no. No, no, no. And most of the scarves are, are buried due to timeliness and things like that. Rotation. So Rotation is key. Yeah. Yeah. The Shaktar scarf, their season's over. That's why they're back there. Mm-hmm. Why do you have a Shaktar scarf? Uh I initially was going to write a book about uh soccer in wartime. But uh then relationships changed between the Ukraine and the United States and their media relations department was like uh uh, yeah, we'll do it, but we didn't tell you we'll do it, so we're not interested anymore. Nice. All right, yeah. hold your kicker. Last okay. quote, last uh, comment from Bart on Twitch. I, I think the Iberian Peninsula, the Adriatic Sea countries, mm-hmm. North Africa, Great Britain, British Isles, Scandinavia, Australia, New Zealand, and maybe Argentina, Chile could host 48 Team World Cups. I would maybe go Argentina, Uruguay. Um, and I think they've actually talked about co-hosting. I don't know if it was the Men's World Cup or it might have been the Women's that, that Argentina was in the mix for early on in this process. 
Uh, I think they work together a little bit more. So maybe go that direction. But yeah, I, I think all those are, are accurate. For the World Cup, now the U.S. could host a 48 team World Cup if they wanted yeah. to. Right. Um, I think Germany could. I think Spain could. I think England could. Yeah. That might be it. Um, China could. Um, that might be it. Who could solely host it? But I think Bart's right. You're going to see these pairings. I mean, if the U.S. is going to pair up with Canada and Mexico to do it, I think everybody's going to pair up. I mean, if you do one in in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, and you bring, you know, the major stadiums in England, but you also bring Glasgow into the mix, you bring Cardiff into the mix, Mm -hmm. uh, you bring Dublin into the mix, you bring Belfast into the mix. Um, Dublin would be different. You'd have to work through that one, and maybe you can, maybe you can't. Uh, at least Belfast would be part of it. It'd be curious to see how that goes, but that would make a lot of sense. I think you, I think Bart's dead on. You'll see more of those than China hosting all of it. Easier yeah. for the politics, too, to get, get the bid over the line as well. Yes, no doubt. All right, what's your kicker as we go? All right, uh, if you've been looking at the Twitters this morning, uh, a couple of things have been added in, in a one plus one to try to come up with three. So start your black helicopters right now. Okay. Uh, Dante Hightower of the New England Patriots opted out of this NFL season. So he is now the fifth New England Patriot to opt out from playing this year for Bill Belichick. Okay. Now the push by Patriot fans and their black helicopters with all of the absences, with all of the player rotation, with Tom Brady not being there anymore, Gronk not being there anymore, everybody who's left, everybody who's opting out. The black helicopter theory is that the Patriots are tanking this season so they can get Trevor Lawrence as the number one pick next wow. year. So, so that's why Trevor Lawrence is trending on Twitter right now. Oh, I, I, I saw that he was trending, and I, I did not know why. Um, uh-huh. So His now we, we have hit the point that teams will use COVID-19 as a tanking mechanism. Apparently so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. This is going to yeah. get really weird this fall. Um, mm-hmm. Buckle up, folks. We'll see how mm-hmm. this goes. Uh, thanks yeah. for hanging out with us this morning. Appreciate it. And we'll be back tomorrow, 9 a.m. Oh, one more question for you. Sorry. And it was an email question. Uh, Nathan oh. Pugh uh, sent this in. Uh, that's, that's, that's all. No, this has nothing to do with it. Well, it does It does a little bit, but it's more about your Swansea team because it's okay. checking on a red. Uh, Brewster, what do you think about Brewster? Do you think he's ready for uh, re- moving in and supplanting Origi? See, that's a tough one because uh, Divock Origi has developed into this super sub. I don't know if Brewster is there immediately. I think that this might be a transitional year if you wanted to do something like that to where he learns the, the Klopp system, grows under it and all that kind of stuff. I think that if, he, if, if that happens, he's a year away from being Divock Origi. I don't think he's Divock Origi right now because of what we've seen from his output in those situations. Do you think he's with Liverpool next year or you think he goes out alone again? I think. Uh, or do see, you just want to keep him at Swansea? Oh, I, I'm selfish. I want to keep him at Swansea. Ask the Colonel about that too. I mean, but, uh, me, El Montaflo, and the Colonel would love to just keep him. Period. Nathan, you can't have him, uh, especially. Well, and then it gets to the issues that what if you know what, what if what if you beat Brentford and then what if you beat Fulham and if you're the 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 third team in. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be selfish for the moment. Colonel in all caps on loan! <laughs> Exclamation marks. See, that's the thing. <laughs> So uh, I, I, I want I want to I hoard I, I want to keep him to be selfish about it. Um, so yeah, but uh, things may change if uh, Swansea wins this uh, go around with Brentford and then beats Fulham in the final. So, uh, but no, I agree with Colonel on loan, Nathan on loan. But uh, things may change. But no, it, it, but if he goes back to Liverpool, I think he's a year away. Okay. I think that's what Nathan was wondering. So, uh, Colonel. But no, is, you can't have him back. Yeah, Colonel's begging. Um, all right. When does Swansea play? Wednesday? Yeah. 
Swansea Brentford second leg Wednesday, uh, Fulham second leg on Thursday, and then the playoff final is Sunday. 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 Okay. Cool. Champions Tormenta, League. Yep. Go ahead. Tormenta minus one sixteen tonight. Going up at a home against Richmond. Richmond's plus two ninety seven. Colonel back and yeah, thinks he's a, a year away as well. All right. That's going to do it. We'll be back in the morning for a wall pass Wednesday. Seriously, thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it. Um, yep. Sometimes we, we get into some other topics here. It does happen from time to time. And right now, I think if you're looking at MLS coming back, you do need to pay attention to what's going on in Major League Baseball and NFL and college football because you're going to learn some things, and, and hopefully the leagues are um, – Hopefully you're going to learn some things not to do as well. And hopefully that's all it is with this Phillies or with this Marlins situation and potentially the Phillies. So it's something where it does cross over a bit. And, yeah, we get sidetracked. Sorry about that. We'll be back. We'll talk a lot of soccer in the morning. And we'll be on our Twitters, at Soccer Down Here, at OSG Nelson, at Long Shoe. you got a question, you can also send it via email, as Nathan did, Soccer Down Here at Gmail. Have a good rest of the day. We'll be back in the morning. Mucha plat, y'all. Mucha plat, y'all.